Before examining the neck vessels, elevate the head of the bed or examination table to about 30 degrees and ask the patient to lie down. To assess the carotid arteries, first inspect the neck for pulsations. To feel the carotid artery, place your left thumb or your right index and middle fingers on the right carotid artery just inside the sternomastoid muscle. Palpate in the lower half of the neck to avoid pressing on the carotid sinus. As you feel the pulse, concentrate on its amplitude and contour. Note any variation in amplitude from beat to beat or with respiration. With your right thumb, palpate the left carotid pulse in the same manner, comparing it with the other side. Do not press on both carotid arteries at once. Next, use the bell of the stethoscope to auscultate for a bruit on both sides of the neck. A bruit is a whooshing, murmur-like sound that suggests arterial narrowing. If present, it would sound like this. Now, examine the jugular veins. Have the patient turn his head away from you slightly. Then, using tangential lighting, inspect the jugular veins on the right side. Usually, the best vein for analysis is the right internal jugular. First, identify the external jugular vein. If it's not visible, compression just above the clavicle may distend it. Then, find the pulsations of the internal jugular vein. Here, they are seen between the two attachments of the sternomastoid muscle. To estimate jugular venous pressure and the pressure in the right atrium, first identify the highest point of pulsation in the internal jugular vein. Next, find the sternal angle. Then measure the vertical distance between that point and the sternal angle in centimeters. The number of centimeters is an estimate of jugular venous pressure. When recording this estimate, also document the angle at which the bed is elevated. In this patient, the internal jugular venous pressure is one centimeter above the sternal angle, with the head of the bed elevated 30 degrees. In another patient, the pulsations of the internal jugular vein are easy to see, especially during expiration. Note their soft, rapid, undulating quality with two elevations and two troughs per heartbeat. Compare them to the single thrust of the carotid artery pulsations. To examine the heart, stand at the patient's right side. Have the patient remain supine with the upper body raised to about 30 degrees. Inspect the precordium, noting any pulsations, heaves, or retractions. There are none here. Look for the apical impulse, which, when visible, is normally seen in the left fifth interspace at or medial to the midclavicular line. Using your fingertips, palpate for pulsations or heart sounds in the right second interspace. left second interspace and left third interspace. Next, palpate for the systolic impulse of the right ventricle. While keeping one finger in the third interspace, place additional fingertips in the fourth and fifth interspaces. If an impulse is palpable, note its location, duration, and amplitude. If the patient's chest has an increased anteroposterior diameter, palpate for the right ventricular impulse high in the epigastric area where it may be easier to feel. Finally, palpate the apical impulse. If it is not visible, feel for its location with your palm and fingers. When you find it, assess it with your fingertips. Observe its location, diameter, 
amplitude, and duration. Identify its location by the interspaces in which you feel the apical impulse and by its distance in centimeters from the mid-sternal or mid-clavicular line. Measure the diameter of the impulse in centimeters. Feel for the amplitude of the apical impulse. It is usually small and feels like a gentle tap. To estimate the duration of the apical impulse, feel it as you listen to the heart sounds with a stethoscope. The normal impulse may last through the first two-thirds of systole, but not longer. Please turn over to your left side. If you can't feel the apical impulse, ask the patient to roll partly onto his left side and try again. Now I'd like to tap on your chest to see the size of your heart. If you still can't feel the apical impulse, estimate heart size by percussion. Starting on the far left of the chest, percuss toward the left border of cardiac dullness in the third, fourth, fifth, and possibly sixth interspaces. Normally, percussion reveals pulmonary resonance laterally and cardiac dullness medially. Before auscultating the heart, let's review normal heart sounds. Closure of the heart valves creates a pair of audible heart sounds. The first sound, S1, accompanies mitral valve closure. The second sound, S2, accompanies aortic valve closure. Pulmonic and tricuspid valve closure may contribute to these sounds. Ventricular systole occurs between S1 and S2. Ventricular diastole occurs between S2 and the next S1. Because diastole usually lasts longer than systole, you can identify the two sounds. One, two, one, two, one, two. You can hear S1 and S2 in the aortic area in the right second interspace close to the sternum, pulmonic area in the left second interspace close to the sternum, left third interspace, tricuspid area in the left fourth and fifth interspaces, and mitral area at the apical impulse. The aortic and pulmonic areas together are sometimes called the base of the heart. For auscultation of the heart, you may choose between two sequences. In the first, start with the diaphragm of the stethoscope and progress from the right second interspace to the left second interspace and down the left sternal border to the apex. Then, with the bell of the stethoscope, listen again at the mitral and tricuspid areas. Starting in the right second interspace helps orient you to the cardiac cycle. In the second sequence, start with the bell and listen first at the mitral and tricuspid areas. Then change to the diaphragm and, starting in the aortic area, listen to all five areas from above down. Starting at the mitral area is useful when you've had to turn the patient to find the apical impulse. The first auscultation sequence is shown in this video. What I'm going to do now is listen to your heart in the various areas of your chest. Now adjust your stethoscope so that you'll be listening through the diaphragm. When pressed firmly on the chest, the diaphragm is best for hearing relatively high-pitched sounds, such as S1, S2, the murmurs of aortic and mitral regurgitation, and pericardial friction rubs. Begin listening at the right second interspace close to the sternum. Note the cardiac rate and rhythm. Identify the first and second heart sounds and listen for extra heart sounds and murmurs. Please breathe deeper than normal. 
Then listen at the left second interspace. Try to hear splitting of S2. Here it is abnormally wide. It comes and goes with respiration. Continue to breathe deep. Proceed along the left sternal border to the third interspace. Again, listen for splitting of S2. Continue to the fourth interspace. and then to the fifth interspace. Finally, listen at the apex. Now switch to the bell of the stethoscope, which is more sensitive to low-pitched sounds, such as S3, S4, and the murmur of mitral stenosis. Listen at the apex again. in the fifth interspace, and in the fourth interspace. Now that you've seen the listening areas in sequence, focus on the heart sounds in each area. S2 is usually louder than S1 in the aortic area. Please breathe deeper than normal. S2 is usually louder in the pulmonic area also. Note the late inspiratory splitting of S2. Its first component, A2, is aortic. Its second component, P2, comes from pulmonic valve closure. In the left third interspace, both A2 and P2 may be heard again. breathe normal now. S2 usually diminishes in intensity as you proceed down the left sternal border. Meanwhile, S1 usually gets a little louder. In the tricuspid area, S1 may sound split. Its softer second component comes from closure of the tricuspid valve. Here at the mitral area, S1 is usually louder than S2. It comes from closure of the mitral valve. To improve your ability to hear S3, S4, and the murmur of mitral stenosis, have the patient roll partway onto his left side which brings the left ventricle closer to the chest wall. Then recheck the position of the apical impulse and place the bell lightly on it. If the patient had an audible S3, it would sound like this. Now, notice how the third heart sound disappears when the bell is placed more firmly on the chest wall. Listen again with light pressure. With firm pressure. And once again with light pressure. To help detect aortic murmurs, 
especially that of aortic regurgitation, have the patient sit up and lean forward. Then ask him to exhale completely and hold his breath out. Using the diaphragm of the stethoscope, listen at the left second interspace Breathe. and down the left sternal border to the apex. Breathe out completely again and hold it. Pause periodically to allow the patient to breathe. Listen for the high-pitched diastolic murmur of aortic regurgitation. If the patient had this murmur, it would sound like this. You may breathe. Take another deep breath. Breathe out and hold it. Heart murmurs can be distinguished from heart sounds by their longer duration. Diastolic murmurs, like this one, usually indicate heart disease. Systolic murmurs can occur in healthy people or in those with heart disease. For example, a loud mid-systolic murmur may be heard in aortic stenosis. If you hear such a loud murmur, palpate the area with the ball of your hand. Palpable vibrations associated with a heart murmur are called a thrill.